morning. Welcome again. Glad you're here with us today. Uh, I'm glad you're watching online as well, uh, wherever you might be. Uh, we're continuing on in our series called Bless. It's a great uh, series. I like the practicality of it. I like uh, looking at passages of Scripture where Jesus interacts with other people uh, and, and just the whole dynamic of it. And so if you're, you're just joining us uh, in this series, the first week we kind of spent setting everything up. The second week was we talked about be in bless, which was before anything else, we're going to pray, which is a crucial, vitally important uh, thing to do throughout your life, not just when blessing other people. Uh, this, the third week was listen, uh, which listening kind of opens up everything else. If you're listening to people, you're going to have an audience with them. You're going to be able to engage with them. This week has been the week I have been looking forward to. It is eat. Is my favorite. I thought about just having like a table up here and just eating for, for 30 minutes and y'all getting to watch. It'd be fun. Um, just, it's so exciting to talk about eating. Next week is serving. Uh, we're going to serve one another and that's another way we can bless and then sharing our story, sharing what God is doing in our lives. So that's the bless series. Like I said, this week we're on eating and it was fun uh, because this week I got to think about something that I think about all the time anyway. I think about eating and we uh, use food for everything in our society. Like we really orient our lives around the meal. How many of you, when you're eating one meal, are talking about, hey, what are we gonna do for the next one? That's me, I always feel like I need to whisper because I don't wanna offend the plate that I'm working on right now. I'm like, shh, what are we gonna do for dinner? Um, so yeah, eating is such a crucial part of our, our lives and our day-to-day, -day, uh, everything going on with our lives. Uh, we use it for all sorts of things. We use it as like a, like a, a stop in between uh, from one place to another. Hey, we should stop and get food on the way, right? It's like a stop we add. Uh, we do it to celebrate. Hey, you got a promotion or you graduated. Let's gorge ourselves on a dead animal carcass. Isn't it great? Uh, or hey, uh, somebody uh, is sick. Let's cook them a meal, right? That's, that's what we do. Or we even use it to grieve, right? We, we, we mourn, we do a funeral, and then we have a reception afterwards where we eat again. If we're bored, we eat. If we're depressed, we eat. Uh, we, we, we go through cartons of ice cream. I mean, it's just what we do. And so one of the things that in a, in a culture like ours where food is so central to what we do, we need to think about how we can use it to bless other people. And not just because we're walking through a series, but if it is this intricate to the everyday rhythms of our lives, then my goodness, it needs to be a part of how we think about reaching the world for Christ, changing the world for Christ. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about how to make our meals a bit more of an of act of worship, really, uh, and in so doing, bless other people. We're going to Luke chapter 7, uh, verse 36 is where we're going to start. And we're going to look at three things, basically a three-course meal uh, that we're going to serve people when we eat with them, whether it's in our home, whether it's in uh, a restaurant, whether it's at their home. There are three things that we're always going to bring to the table. They're abstract things, but I think they're going to change the way you eat. And the first one is we're going to serve grace. We're going to serve grace. Look at verse 36. One of the Pharisees, we'll learn his name is Simon, asked him to eat with him. That's Jesus. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Now, we don't know why Simon, the Pharisee, has invited Jesus over for dinner. It could be he's like Nicodemus. He's genuinely interested in knowing more about this man who's speaking with such authority, doing these miracles. He wants to know about him. It's probably not likely, but it's a possibility. It could be that Simon is an older member of society, an older Pharisee, and he sees this young upstart prophet, and he's like, hey, I'm going to bring this guy under my wing. I'm going to see if I can shift his perspective just a little bit, and we can use him to further the goals of the Pharisees and maybe the nation of Israel itself. So it's a possibility. It could all just be that he's wanting to challenge him. He wants to discredit him. He wants to treat him poorly. We don't know why Jesus has been invited to dinner, but we do know two things. Jesus knows the motivation. Jesus knows all things. So Jesus knows the motivation and Jesus still shows up. He still shows up. And what an act of grace this actually is. When we read this story, we focus on the relationship between Jesus and the woman and the grace that God has shown her, rightfully so. But there's another layer of grace being shown to Simon the Pharisee that we miss because we like to vilify him. 
And, and, and it's that Jesus would even show up. Jesus, Jesus is probably aware of the fact, he's definitely aware of the fact that the Pharisees are going uh, to, to reject him. They're gonna treat him better. They're eventually going to become enemies. They're probably not right now, but they're definitely like suspicious, I think. And Jesus is like, yeah, I'll come eat with you. I know it might be a trap, but I'm gonna come and eat with you. And we learn later on that Jesus did not receive any of the normal hospitality gestures that are common to that culture and in that day. We learn later on that he was supposed to have received a kiss of welcome. He didn't get that. We know that he was supposed to be given water to wash his feet or to wash his hands. Didn't get that either. We know that he was probably supposed to be given some cheap sort of olive oil to kind of freshen up before dinner. He's given none of these things. And in that culture and in that day, he easily could have set up, stood up and said, look, Simon, it's very clear you don't want me here. You're trying to treat me badly. I don't have to take this. I'm out. And then gone to like McDonald's or something. Jesus is gracious. I mean, imagine going over to somebody's house and when they, when they open the door, they don't say, hey, welcome. They're just like, mm, okay. And you come in and you're like, well, that was weird. And you're like, hey, can I wash my hands real quick? Before? No, you can't have any water. Well, can I have some hand sanitizer then? To, to No. We would be like, okay, this is really rude. Some of us might even be like, dude, like, I'm out of here. Like, why are you treating me like this? But Jesus is gracious. He's kind. He sticks with it. He extends grace. And then there's this woman. This woman who's heard the message of grace and forgiveness. She's heard it at a time before, okay? So it's not that she, she's heard, heard Jesus teaching here. She probably heard him preaching, and she has now sought him out to say, how can I say thank you to you for telling me this message of grace and forgiveness, for telling me that I am not the sum total of the sin in my life? I want to say thank you. And she witnesses this disrespect that Jesus receives, and she takes it into her own hands to bless Jesus where Simon should have done that. And what's really cool about this whole thing, the way that the Greek reads, it's in the imperfect tense, all the verbs that she's doing, and that means that it's ongoing. So throughout the entire meal, this woman is crying, using her hair to wipe this man's feet, and breaking open a very strong smelling perfume on his feet, which would have overwhelmed probably the smell of the food. I mean, imagine going to dinner with say like a business client. It's a big deal for you. And the whole time there's this person that you don't know and that they don't know either, weeping at their feet very loudly. The whole dinner. And Simon, kind of understandably so, is put out about it. He's like, if Jesus... Is he going to do anything? Because it was Jesus' responsibility to say, Simon, can you take care of this? Can you take care of her? What's interesting is the way the grace has affected each of their perceptions. For Simon the Pharisee, he doesn't live in a world of grace. He doesn't operate in that world. His belief is that if you are a good person, if you are righteous, if you do good things, then God will forgive you, which kind of begs the question, why would God need to forgive you? But if you happen to make a mistake, if you're a good person, God will take care of you. God will let it slide. God will forgive you if you do the right things in response to that. But for the woman, she's a sinner. She can't be forgiven. She lives a life of sin. She's dug herself too far into the hole and she'll never get out. And that's the world that Simon lives in. He doesn't operate in a world of grace. But the woman has received this message that she's not the sum total of her past. She's not the sum total of the mistakes that she's made. She can become loved, forgiven, cherished. The difference is that Jesus does not see her for her past, where Simon can only see her past. Jesus instead sees her for the person that God could transform her to become. Everything that she was supposed to be, Jesus sees that in her and seeks to make that happen in her life. And if we're gonna serve grace at our tables when we sit down to a meal with somebody else, we've got to see the people around us for who God could make them to be, not for the person that they have been. Not for the, we can't fixate on the past. We have to see the transformation that God's grace could have in their life. Your table should be a place of peace. Now don't confuse that with quiet. I haven't had a quiet meal in four years. Peace and quiet are not the same things, but it should be a place of, of comfort, of rest, a place of healing, a place where God's grace is extended, almost like a holy place where you feel the presence of God. So how do we do this? Well, one, we need to learn from the past. Look, some of us 
our experiences with eating are not good. Some of us are lonely and we eat alone. And you're like, Travis, this doesn't make any sense to me because I've been eating alone for the last year because of this virus and stuff like that. Maybe grace is something to extend to yourself in that regard. Allow God to speak grace into your life there. Maybe we miss somebody who's not been at our table in a long time because they've passed away. And so there's pain when we eat. There's that empty chair. Maybe growing up, dinner was not about grace. Dinner was about either A, getting your meal as fast as you could so that you could go on to the next event that your family was doing because you were just moving. Or it wasn't about grace because there was somebody at your table who was engaged in destructive habits and the meal was all about eating as quickly as you could so you could get away from the table, so you get away from that person. Getting away from dinner without being yelled at or hit was a victory. That was a good meal. And maybe that's why meals for you don't have an air of grace about them. Or maybe you have an eating disorder, you struggle with an eating disorder. And so when you sit down to a meal, there's all this anxiety, there's pressure, there's temptation, there's guilt, there's shame. Because you're worried about that and you're like, I can't. I can't. Like, and maybe as much as I was looking forward to this message today, you weren't. God wants to take these, these, this baggage that we bring to the table with us, literally bring to the table. And he wants to exchange it for grace. He wants to give us grace. He wants to give us peace. He wants to not let these things be barriers for us to extend grace to other people that are around us at our meals. We have to prayerfully consider the baggage that we bring to the table. You can be the one. You can be the person who has their life changed. You don't have to keep perpetuating the the evil that was done at the table. You don't have to keep allowing the evil one to rule your dinner table. You can allow the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to come eat with you because he wants to and he can change your meal. That also means that we need to be extravagant in our hospitality. This woman like goes out uh, over the top to bless Jesus. She washes his feet with her own tears. She doesn't give him cheap olive oil. She gives him a very expensive perfume. So if we're entertaining people, if we're blessing people for the sake of the gospel, not to show off all the cool things we have, not to show how nice our house is, not to show what a great host we are, but if we are genuinely trying to bless another human being at the dinner table, go nuts. Go over the top. Like, really, be extravagant in your hospitality, just like this woman. This woman uh, would have an HGTV show at, at, at how hospitable she was for Jesus. Be the same. Think about the person who's coming over to dinner, who's having a meal with you. What do they like? What would they enjoy? Does that mean we eat inside or outside? Do we eat uptown or down home? Do we eat China or Chinette? Like what would this person, how would they feel grace? And how can I convey God's grace through the, the setting, the environment, the meal? Again, it doesn't mean you have to spend a bunch of money. It means you have to be considerate of the person and the people who are eating with you. So that's the appetizer. That's the first course. We're going to serve grace. And grace gets everybody excited. An appetizer gets people excited about food. Grace gets people ready to to enjoy the next part, which is we're going to serve truth. Look at verse 40. We're going to serve truth. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Warning. If Jesus ever says, I have something to say to you, just be ready. And he said, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, basically two years worth of wages, and the other 50, which is two months. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you've judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Which implies what? Simon hasn't even looked at her. Look at this woman, I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Wow. The critical point in this story that Jesus tells, this parable, is that both people were in need of forgiveness and neither one of them could acquire it on their own. They couldn't buy that forgiveness for themselves. And so Jesus asks 
this question. Which one of them is going to love the money lender, the one who forgave them more? And Simon kind of begrudgingly says what? I guess it'd be the person who was forgiven more. Then Jesus goes through and, and points out all the ways in which Simon has failed to be a hospitable host. Can you imagine like having a meal with somebody and then after it was over being like, I didn't like the food. I thought the dishes were tacky. And your curtains, oh my goodness. Can we talk about those? But this is Jesus. And Jesus uses this as a point of illustration. The summary statement on this whole ordeal for Jesus is, look, she loved a whole lot because she knows that she's been forgiven for a whole lot. And the implication is that Simon has not loved. And it's not because Simon doesn't have things to be forgiven for. Again, in the story, he would be the person with 50 debt. He still has a debt. Simon doesn't think he has a lot to be forgiven for, and therefore he doesn't have a lot of love to give. And you can compare the way this news is received for the two of them. For the woman, this has set her free. This truth has come in and completely set her free. It overwhelms her to the point where she barges in on this dinner party of which she's not invited. And she begins to bless this man whom she probably hasn't met personally. She goes through this really extravagant display. Truth has stepped in and canceled this debt that she owed. And she is overwhelmed and thrilled about it. Simon, on the other hand, is not as thrilled. He's not as happy. He has put all of his effort in being a good person and being a righteous person. From the time he was probably very little, this is how he understood life. You do the right thing. And if you do the right thing, God will accept you. And Jesus has now come in and dropped this story on him, which has completely overturned this lie that he believed. For the woman, the lie she believed was that her past made her worthless. And that lie is overturned by the truth. But for Simon, the lie that you can earn forgiveness, that you can do enough things to make God owe you, that lie gets overturned in Simon's life, and it is not a welcome truth. It's a truth he needs to hear, but it's not welcome. It's changing his world view. So this leaves us really with two questions. The first is, how does this news strike you? If you're like me and you grew up in church and genuinely try to do like the right thing, and you want people to accept you based on doing the right thing, you're the good kid, Right? You were the good one. You've got a family member, maybe that's the black sheep. And you're like, God, they're never going to get their life right, but I've got it all together. How would you feel if somebody came to dinner with you and said, actually, that person that can't get their life together is closer to God than you are? We'd be a little like, excuse me? We'd be like Simon. It makes him a little more understandable as a person, right? Right? We like the idea of grace, but a lot of us like to be in control. And because we like to be in control, we like the idea that God might owe us something. And we think the way we get God to owe us something is by doing enough good things. People, you cannot balance out the ledger. Whether you have little sin or great sin, however you want to view it, neither debt can be canceled out on your own. Because in that culture, in that day and age, when you had a debt, you know what they did to you when you couldn't pay it off? They threw you in prison, which doesn't make a lot of sense because how are you supposed to work and make money to pay off the debt? All of us, at one point or another, have been imprisoned by sin, and you can't get out. That's why you can't work to earn it, out, earn it, because the whole time you're trying to accrue good deeds to pay off your sin, you're also accruing more debt. And so Jesus comes and he dies on the cross for our sins. He pays the penalty, he pays off the debt, and then he opens the gates of the prison. He's like, you're free, go ahead and get out of here. Oh, and by the way, I'm coming to dinner at your place tonight because we're gonna talk about our relationship because you now have a friendship, a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that's what he wants to offer you today. If you've never done that, if you've never walked out of the open doors of the prison before, Why? Who would just sit in the cell? I mean, other than that one story about Paul and Silas, but who would just sit in the cell? Get out. Be free. Trust in Christ. You can come talk to me over there about it. You can text in. You can put it in the chat. You can yell out right now and we'll talk to you. I don't care. Interrupt me. Jesus Christ wants to do something amazing in your life and he wants to come and eat with you. And that leads us to the second point. Which is, Travis, what does this have to do about food? I was promised a message about food. And you've di diverted quite a bit. I think it's interesting how much we define ourselves and our cultures by what we eat. 
right? So like some of us, our only interaction with other cultures are in eating their food, right? So I go eat Korean, I go eat Chinese, I go eat Indian, I go eat at a fast food restaurant that says that they're trying to do ethnic food. I'm looking at you, Taco Bell. Like that's what we do. And then we define ourselves by what we eat, right? I am gluten-free. I am vegan, right? We don't say I eat vegan. You say I am vegan, right? I, my, my personal dining philosophy is from, taken from the movie Predator, where Arnold Schwarzenegger says, if it bleeds, we can kill it and eat it. So uh, again, animals, not, not others. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's my, my philosophy. So you want to be able, we define ourselves right by what we eat. And this is kind of the point that I'm trying to make here is that you are what you eat is kind of true. Because in, in this day and age, this man and this woman, Simon and this woman, define themselves by what they did. We define ourselves by what we consume. Whether it's food, whether it's entertainment, whether it's sports, whether it's politics, whatever it is. And whatever it is that you consume, that's what you're going to serve up for dinner. So are you spending time with the Lord? Are you spending time consuming the word of God? Are you consuming as we'll take the, Lord, uh, the, the, the Lord's Supper today? Eating his flesh, drinking his blood, Right? That's what Jesus talks about. Is that what we're doing? Are we spending time with him? We had some friends when we first got married uh, that were vegetarian. So when we would go over to their house, what did we eat? Vegetarian, which was very difficult for me at that stage of the game in my life. I've matured a great deal since then, and, and I'm totally, okay, I'm, I'm mostly fine with it. But they would serve us what they ate. You are going to give people at your dinner table what you eat. So what you're consuming is what you're going to talk about. If you, eat talk pol- if you eat politics all day long, guess what you're going to talk about? Doctrine, religion, whatever it is. But if you are spending time in the word of God, you are going to speak about the Savior that you love so much because you have been forgiven much. You will love much by speaking of what you love so much. So serve truth. How do you do this? Well, one, it takes willingness. A lot of us aren't willing to serve truth. I love how willing Jesus is to eat with this man, even though he knows what's going to happen. We need to offer authenticity, honesty, truth. Share with them what God is teaching you. Whatever it is, share with them and be willing to do that. But also look for timing. How many of you ever had like a really great piece of chocolate cake, a dessert, really good, and then somebody like dropped a kale salad like right afterwards? It's weird. One, it's a kale salad, which why? But two, it's okay, kale's fine. But why would you put that after the chocolate cake? It doesn't make sense. Maybe some cultures do it, but we don't. So some of us try to shoehorn the gospel in kind of weirdly, like a kale salad, when all we need to do is tell them about what God is doing in our life. Listen to what they're saying. Again, there's that listening word. And then respond to it and say, hey, it sounds like you're basing your success or you're basing your worth. It sounds like your week really lived or died by whether or not this happened in your life. Tell you what, I've lived that. Guess what God is teaching me about that? He's teaching me this. So we've talked about serving grace. We've talked about serving uh, truth. Let's talk about the dessert, serving forgiveness. Look at verse 48. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this? Who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Her faith saved her when she heard the message of forgiveness. Not right here, but when she heard the message of forgiveness earlier. And this tells us something about God. God is always the initiator when it comes to forgiveness. God is the initiator of love. And we respond to his grace. We respond to his love, not him responding to us. He's always the initiator. And then it brings us to forgiveness. It brings us to faith. And so love always precedes precedes forgiveness. It precedes our perceived need of forgiveness I'm not gonna seek out forgiveness unless I I am uh, loving, unless I'm awakened to some kind of love because what I'll realize is I've done something wrong and not remorseful about the consequences or the impact or whatever. I hurt somebody. And so I'm gonna seek out forgiveness because I hurt them. I didn't violate just a law. I violated the law of love and that's what moves somebody to seek forgiveness and restoration. But it's also love that allows us to forgive. We get real kind of touchy when we talk about forgiving people. 
It's because we, 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 we want to make qualifications about it, right? Like this person was abusive. How do I forgive them? Do I just forget what they did? This person was toxic in my life. What am I going to do? Look, if you're worried about toxic people in your life and cutting them out of your life, I've got a, I've got a hint for you. You are going to have to find a way to get away from yourself. We are all toxic people. I live with three toxic people. I love them very much, and they live with me, and I'm a toxic person. When it comes to forgiving, we need to recognize that if we're going to eat with people, eventually they're going to let us down. So be forgiving. And look at how God forgives people. Do a study of God's forgiveness in Scripture, and then do your best to forgive as he forgives. So how do we do this? Let's look at a couple passages real quick. Revelation 19 Revelation 19 says this, verse six, when I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen and bright and pure for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this down. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Every meal you eat is like a rehearsal dinner for the marriage supper of the lamb. We're looking forward to a time when God's victory that he's going to give us at the end of all things is going to be a reality. And there is forgiveness at that table. Forgiveness is one of the marquee facts of that table because to be at that table, you have to be forgiven. So make your table a place of forgiveness. Be hopeful that God will do something amazing at your table. So many of God's miracles happen around food in the Bible. It's incredible. We should do a whole series on it. Your table can be a place of miracle if you will expect God to work. Also, it looks like mercy. Look at Matthew 26. Should be a familiar passage. 26, Matthew 20, sorry. Yeah, 26. 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many, for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of it, of the fruit of the vine, until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom, which, by the way, is at the marriage supper of the Lamb. If we're going to eat with people, as I said, they're going to let us down. Jesus is eating the last supper here with people that were going to let him down the very next day. One of them is in the process of letting him down right then. Be merciful at your table. Let your table be a place of grace. Let your table be a place of truth. Let it be a place of forgiveness because we're about to take and eat the Lord's Supper, which you can go get those elements now if you're participating at home. And, and when we sit down at the Lord's table, those are the elements that are here. Yes, we have the bread and the cup, of course, but also present at the table is grace. God's grace extended to us. There's truth we talk about. We celebrate the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for those who have believed and professed that, this table is for you. And then there's forgiveness. We've all been forgiven. And maybe there's something right now in your life. Maybe there's a relationship in your life that's kind of disjointed. I would encourage you to reach out to that person even now as we wrap up. Just send them a text or lean over to them and say, hey, I'm sorry. Can we talk about what went wrong, what happened? So you can eat at the table with a clear conscience. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you are a God who is gracious. You're a God of truth and you're a God who's forgiving. And as we come and dine at the table that you instituted so long ago, we do it with an eye towards a greater table, a table when you will dine with us, not to the bread and the cup and the presence of your people, but in the flesh. And we will be here with you and you with us and all we've ever hoped for will be realized because of you. Lord, may you bless your people as they do what you've commanded us to do, which is to take and remember.